Hello, uh, this is um, a video to go over section test number two um, for Phil 1100. Um, uh, the first thing I'll point out about this is the due date. I've changed to November 13th, so I'm posting it today. You will have 12 days to work on this one. Um, this is partially uh, sort of an apology for taking so long getting your grades back to you. Um, I have just a few left to do right now, so if you're um, waiting by the end of the day, uh, those videos should, or those, those videos, those assignments should be graded and back to you. Um, I've considered them, I'm just revising through my comments and um, returning them to you now. Um, now, uh, one thing um, I noticed, a uh, number of you are not utilizing the, the required content, the video material um, for this course. It says right on the test that this is required content. It says right on the Moodle page. Uh, what I was noticing um, it, for for some, um, and I've put this comment on uh, some of your assignments, is that uh, generally while your, uh, your discussion was interesting and I gave you some grades for it, um, it bore no resemblance to the conversation about the material that we're trying to have in this class. And so, um, it, it, so in a lot of cases, this took your responses sort of off topic, utilized that because um, effectively not not screening the video content for this course is in the context of an on-campus class the same as not coming to class, right? So this is an online course, I give you online content, and if you don't use that online course or content, it's effectively you're trying to do the class without ever coming to class. Um, uh, all of this boilerplate here um, at the beginning of the test is, um, well, it's, it's pretty standard. Uh, you should recognize it. Um, uh, the policies are all the same. Um, I've gone over that till I'm blue in the face, so there's no point um, in doing that. So November 13th by 12 noon. Um, use that extra time. Um, the idea is that um, I've taken so long on this grading because you've written a lot and I want to give your work the attention and the commentary that it deserves and it, it, as, as your grades come back to you, you'll notice that my comments are um, fairly extensive. In some cases I've written more than you wrote <laughs> and um, that sort of thing. Uh, it, I've been having lots of discussions and teaching and learning kind of contexts about this sort of thing. And uh, maybe it's me as a philosopher, and I've got some colleagues that agree with me too, but I'll just speak for myself. Um, but I will always sacrifice speed for substance, right? Um, and related to that, um, it, 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 this is part of the reason why I'm giving you as much time with this material as I am. Um, so use this time. If you're behind on screening the videos, screen those videos. Right? Uh, if you're behind on the forums, utilize the forums. I have no problem with you discussing the test material on the forums. Um, no problem whatsoever. Uh, this is good use, right, because the forums are designed to enhance your understanding of the material, and if you're using them around the exam time to enhance your understanding of the material, good on you, that's exactly what they're there for, right? Um, so, uh, the videos are required content. You're due date, you've got 12 days for this, that is two days per question, right? Um, also, another way to use this time is to um, give yourself time to edit, right? In some cases, I've noticed typographical, typographical or grammatical errors um, that are, it, it, I'm not a spelling teacher, right? I'm not a grammar instructor. This is, this is not, that's not my role. Um, but when your grammar and spelling actually is harmful to the clarity of your account of the position that you're discussing or harmful to um, the clarity of your argument where required, um, you know, it's, I need your arguments to be clear. Um, and so also two paragraphs each for a response. Um, I'm quite clear about that, right? They're short answer questions requiring a minimum of two paragraphs of writing for your response. 
um, a paragraph is a bare minimum of three sentences, but your, so, uh, your responses should be substantial and exceed this minimum. The idea is that uh, the reason why I throw that um, on there, I don't, I don't care if you do it in one paragraph or two paragraphs or that sort of thing. Paragraphs are ways of organizing ideas, though, and they help your reader parse the information. That's why we've got paragraphs. Paragraphs are there so that we can section ideas, concepts, that sort of thing off into manageable bits so that the person reading it can wrap their mind around it. That's, that's, that's helpful to your reader and helpful to your clarity, which is one of my requirements, but, uh, or one of my, my assessment modes, right? Um, but, um, I put this minimum there because in the past, before I put a minimum up, I was getting like two sentences in response to these questions and I cannot see you substantively and sufficiently treating this material in less, right? Um, so don't just do the bare minimum, answer the question until you have a clear, concise, nuanced, well thought out response that engages with the material sufficiently. That's the, that's the idea, that's, that's why I'm doing that. Um, so there are six questions, five points each for a total of 30 points, um, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, it, one more thing about the comments on your last uh, assignment, I'm not trying to be a jerk, I'm trying to be therapeutic, I'm trying to get you to enhance your ability to argue. And um, I've been thinking about this a lot. We are arguing with one another as a culture more than any other time in history, especially in terms of the written word because we're online. We're commenting on news articles. We're, you know, discussing Facebook posts. We're um, tweeting at one another, et cetera, et cetera. We're actually arguing more. Right, so that we are able to critically assess the arguments that come across our desk, right, or the screen of our phone, and to actually make a compelling, clear case for something in a concise way in an online environment. It, these these are important skills to exist in the world. You see that there is no shortage of examples of how people fail at this um, out out there in the big bad world. So, um, anyhow, required content that you're responsible for. Um, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, boing, and Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, and it's just um, uh, books one, two, and is section one of book three for Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And Hobbes, it's chapters six through 19. Um, my video for Hobbes is a bit old, but um, nonetheless, I think I provide sort of a, comprehensive sort of treatment of the salient points in that argument. Um, my apologies about the old video. I've been thinking about re-recording it, but um, I like the way things are put on that video. Um, and uh, it, 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 your comments about, you know, the, the out of dateness of my hairstyle in that video aside, it is in 10 minute chunks, which I think is going to be helpful to you as well. Um, Anyhow, um, then the video material, um, it's all, all of that's posted to Moodle. It's not a ton for this section because there aren't addi additional good videos for Aristotle and Hobbes out there, um, but nonetheless, it's there, right? Um, so, three questions on Aristotle, um, three books of the Nicomachean Ethics, one question on each of the books, um, three questions uh, about Hobbes. Um, about three of the major movements in Hobbes' argument. Um, so, should be fairly straightforward this time. Um, be sure to break these questions down into the parts and answer them fully, right, as well. Um, so, question one, Aristotle. Um, discuss the function argument discussed by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. So basically, I want a summation of uh, the function argument. How? By this argument, does Aristotle arrive at his definition of happiness? Part two, right? Um, so, of all things that have a this is the beer store guy example that I give you in the video. Um, so, uh, but keep in mind that Aristotle is looking for something more general, 
um, than that. Um, it, key points to keep in mind, uh, this is the point where Aristotle connects the human function to virtue, to the human good, that is happiness, eudaimonia, condition of flourishing, right? Um, so mention all those three parts and show how they come together to arrive at a definition of happiness. Don't get too bogged down discussing the three lives. You know, it's, 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 it's not too terribly relevant. Just focus, laser focus in on this argument itself. Right? So that's the idea for that question. Um, question two. In book two of the Nicomachean, you see what I'm doing in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics, here's the important argument. In book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, here is the important argument. Book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines virtue of character and discusses how it's developed. What should you do? Define virtue of character and briefly discuss how it is developed. Part one. Part two, important caveat. In book two, section four of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle identifies one, two, three requirements for genuine virtue. And I quote the passage, but surely actions are not enough, page 22. Discuss each. And by discuss, I don't mean list. I mean discuss, right? He introduces, first requirement is blah, blah, blah. Well, what he means by this is blah, blah, blah. You see, I, I want an explanation of those three requirements. Why, why in the heck aren't actions? Why isn't doing the same thing over and over and over again enough to habituate us? And why do we need to know, do our actions in a particular way and have those actions result in a particular kind of state? And as soon as Aristotle uses a term like state, you might define it. There, there is a thought, right? So. Um, Anyhow, uh, that's the second of your questions. Now, surprise, in Book 3, Section 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics, see what I did there? Aristotle draws a distinction between what he considers to be properly involuntary in a category of actions that he terms non-voluntary. First, introduce the general category of involuntary actions. Uh, it, and to explain here, the general category of involuntary actions. On page 30, he says that there are two kinds of actions that might be considered involuntary. Remember that annoying thing that he does? Responsibility is only for the voluntary, so we should define it. Well, what we're not responsible for is involuntary actions, and they're this small little category of two kinds of actions. Right? He does that annoying thing. Um, so it, he introduced those two categories of um, actions that we're not responsible for, right? Um, that he would consider involuntary. Um, and uh, with regard to this section, I'm going to point out that there are excellent explanatory notes way at the back of your book here. Um, uh, there's one on 203 that uh, relates to um, the non-voluntary, involuntary uh, distinction, and uh, there is an excellent account of force, right, where um, he explains where Aristotle is using the word the victim, right, um, and that, that might actually be handy to you, right. So, hint. Um, it next, discuss the distinction between properly involuntary actions and those actions that he terms non-voluntary, followed, so three, uh, with, uh, by, by a brief discussion of why Aristotle would bother to add this distinction. And that explanatory note on page 203 of your text does a pretty good job of this, right? As I introduce it to my in-class students, I, I call it don't tell people I'm using this kind of language, but the, the no jackasses kind of clause, right? The no jerks clause. Anyhow, um, it, it shows us something about the scope of responsibility and that the scope of responsibility is beyond actions. And I've said too much, so that's enough on question three. Now, let's move to Owen Mr. Thomas Hobbes. I like this argument. I like this argument partially because I want to throw it against the wall. Right. Um, lots of people have made their careers by 
you know, trying to refute this argument, there are a few really interesting ways to do so. I tried to isolate this as part of your discussion forum question um, right now, but nonetheless, three questions. Hobbes, no, question number four, introduces a rather bleak account of human nature and describes the natural condition of mankind in detail. All right. This is chapters 6 through 13, and, and, and the work he does all of that. Briefly introduce each. All right. So I want you to give an account of human nature. All right. You know, appetite, aversion, all led by desire. Desire is not for this or that thing, but really power. You might bring up power. Um, and, you know, how does this lead to the natural condition of uh, mankind, where is it, where, it, which, which arises in a condition of war, of each against the rest, right? Um, so that's the first part of the question. Briefly introduce each, followed by a discussion of how, according to Hobbes, the state of nature, the natural condition of mankind, arises as a consequent of his account of human nature. Right, so it's not just discuss this and then discuss this. Discuss how this leads to that. Followed by might be a bit misleading. Right, um, you could kind of do this all at once. Here, here's what kind of creatures human beings are. Because we are these kinds of creatures, these desires lead us to this condition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then describe the condition. That might be a good way to um, outline your response. But nonetheless, you see that's three things. It's not just do this, do this, but it's do this, talk about how this leads to that, and then describe that. All right, so um, now, question five. In chapter 14, Hobbes distinguishes between the right of nature and the laws of nature. Define each. So what's a right of nature? What are the laws of nature? Now, you should keep in mind, like, there are bloody 19 laws of nature that Hobbes brings up here, right? Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't need a discussion of the 19 laws of nature, right? The most important one that Hobbes introduces is that first law of nature. So if you're introducing what laws of nature are, it might be smart to engage that first law of nature, right? You know... <clears throat> which is on your page. Let me see, it's chapter 14. Oh, I must be getting old. I don't recall where it is. It's like the second page, page oh, chapter 14. Where is it? I'm in chapter 14 now. Here it is. It's page 290. And the fundamental law of nature. He even calls it the fundamental law of nature, so you know it's the important one. Right. That every man ought to endeavor peace as far, for, uh, as far as he has hope of attaining it, and when he cannot obtain it. That he may seek and use all the helps and advantages of war. Right. Transitioned into a pirate there for some reason. But nonetheless, um, yeah, so that's, that's the first law of nature. Right. And um, the, when I introduce this notion, it's kind of the Hedesian bargain that he's laying out. Do you, do you want a state of peace or do you want war? War, Really, it's up to you, but self-interest shows you that, and I just gave you a little bit too much there with the word self-interest. In the same section, Hobbes introduces the idea of a covenant. Why are covenants important to Hobbes? It's an interesting question. Why, why do we need to come to these mutual agreements of an undetermined ending, right? There's, well, they're so important to Hobbes that he considers covenants in the making and keeping of covenants, this is chapter 15, to be the foundation for justice and really the kind of operative force that stands behind the laws of nature, which it calls the convenient articles of peace, right? So why are these covenants important to Hobbes? Right. So that's, that's the two parts, you know, three parts, really, of that question. Right of nature, laws of nature, covenants. And so anyhow, that's question five. Question six. Uh, discuss 
the particular covenant that gives rise um, to the Commonwealth introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17, being sure to cite the covenant itself found on page 227. So um, I'm going to tell you this right now, just so that there are not um, questions about this later, right? This is ex as explicit as possible. Question number six in each of your responses for a full point should start, quote, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition that thou give, uh, give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. That's the way you're your, your, all of your questions should start, right? Just quote it, right? That's worth a point. If all you do in question number six is quote that, that's worth a point and you get one, right? If that's all you do. Now, discuss this covenant that you've already quoted as introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17. So what's the nature of this covenant? What's going on there? Briefly discuss how this covenant, which establishes sovereign power, breaks down the distinction between public and private good in the person of the sovereign. Now, right, this is the subject of chapter 19. Right? This, is, this is why Hobbes included chapter 19 in the first place. Here is the problem. I'll lay it out very clearly for you, and this, this I consider sort of the bonus at the end of this video. All right. Here is the problem. Who, according to Hobbes, is sufficiently trustworthy in and of themselves to wield sovereign power? Who's morally good enough that we can trust them to be good people that do fine actions in the, the Aristotelian sense? Right? Who is sufficiently virtuous to hold this sovereign power and to be trusted to calculate the greatest good for the greatest number, or put another way, right, you know, put aside their own self interested motives and do what's right for society as a whole. Hobbes' response You got this from your answer to question four. Nobody, nobody is trustworthy enough that we can expect that they should put self-interest aside and calculate what's good for the public and enact that in a reliable way. Why? Because the passions are so strong that uh, private self-interest always wins out over any sort of will to do good for the public. By Hobbes account, always and everywhere this happens. But we can trust people to do. Hobbes argues, is calculate what's in their own best interest. Then you should ask yourself, where does the power of the sovereign come from, according to Hobbes? It comes from you, me, everybody. So, how powerful and how, how wealthy is any sovereign? They're powerful and wealthy to the extent that their societies thrive. Uh, this is this is why you know a poor nation's leader is less powerful than a wealthy, well-off nation's leader. Right? The better we do, the more powerful the sovereign is. The wealthier we are, the wealthier the leader of our nation is, etc., etc., etc. So, what's in the best interest of this individual that we do well? Right? That's how he breaks down the distinction between public and private good in the person of the sovereign, because in seeking their own private ends, the sovereign actually is sort of a byproduct, produces the public good. And that's what this whole honking mechanism with this big crazy mullet guy made up of all sorts of small people is there to do, right? That's, that's the point of this whole mechanism. Right, to break down, to create a situation wherein one selfish jerk, just like the rest of us, just like all of us, right, actually winds up using their self-interested desire for power after power that ends only with their death. 
Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anyhow, that's the position I'm asking you to discuss with regard to Hobbes. So, uh, to recap, use the extra time. You've got 12 days for this material. Um, you, you review those videos. It's due noon on November 13th. Minimal two paragraphs per response, but, you know, the idea is treat the argument. Five points each, 30 points total. That's Hutch and Test 2. <sighs> Have good days, one for each of you.